You're listening to The Dental Guys, special release, COVID-19 infection control and OSHA update with Mary Gavoni. Will infection control ever be the same after this COVID-19 crisis? Mary Gavoni thinks not. We bring her on to discuss how this will change your practice infection control and how you should be preparing now for what might come next when we go back to work. This week on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this special release episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. John, this is one of of those episodes that I think is right in line, Wes, with where we've been going Mm. over the the last few days. You know, we've been trying to keep you guys uh, up to date with what's happening, how we're responding to it in our practices uh, from all angles. And this is one of the most important angles that we need to be responding to, which is the infection control and liability. And what do we do in our practices to kind of prepare for that side of things? And we've got somebody with us today who is truly an expert in that world. And that's Mary Gavoni. Welcome, Mary, to the show. We're glad to have you. Oh, thank you. Happy to be here. And tell us a little bit about yourself for those who don't know or are not familiar with you. Who are you and what do you do? All right. Well, I am a dental assistant and a hygienist. I've worked in dentistry for over 48 years, so been around the block a few times. And so I've worked in clinical dentistry, chair side, doing clinical hygiene. I've been a dental hygiene, dental assisting educator. And I first got interested in infection control in the late 1980s during the HIV AIDS epidemic because I owned a staffing service at the time. And I had a lot of employees who went out to work in different dental practices. And I didn't really have control over what they were experiencing, whether there were gloves or masks or good sterilization procedures, but I had the liability because I was an employer. So I went and learned everything that I could and became an OSHA outreach trainer to help my my practices and so ultimately sold the staffing service and I've been doing education in infection control and OSHA compliance now since the early 90s. But I've never wow. seen anything like this before. Yeah. Wow. So I mean you've seen a lot over the years the change from, you know, HIV all the way through to the unknown of today and right. let's let's just get right into today and talk about the information and misinformation that's circulating about this virus, about COVID-19, about the pandemic in general, um, where do you feel is the best place people should go to just learn about what's really going on out there and, and, and the realities behind just kind of the virus in general, the pandemic in general? Because there's so much information out there and some of it maybe not as good as, as others. Oh, absolutely. The the key resource that that we all should be depending on is our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, because they are the the standard setters for um, care for safe health care, and that's where much of the information funnels through. And God bless Dr. Anthony Fauci; he's my hero, the the truth teller out there about what's going on. But there's also an organization in dentistry called OSAP, Organization for Safety, Asepsis, and Prevention. And this is an organization dedicated to infection prevention and safety in dentistry specifically. And it's been around for 30 plus years. And right now what OSAP has done is made all of their member resources available to everyone, whether you're a member or not. And so those are based on CDC guidelines, World Health Organization information. So if someone felt that the CDC was a little more um, 
focused on perhaps on the medical side of healthcare and not quite as much on dentistry, OSAP is the best resource. And you can go to their website at osap.org, osap.org. John, I was wondering, I was thinking about this for a minute while she was telling us a little bit about these expert uh, places to go and look for resources and the specific things um, that we can learn from this organization you just mentioned. And if you have questions for Mary, leave those in the comments section below uh, during this uh, stream and either we'll get them answered by my Mary or Mary herself might be able to see those and answer those as well. But um, it, what, where are some people, I mean, there's a lot of misinformation coming out. Where, where, what should we avoid? Well, for the most part, avoid getting your information from social media. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of YouTube videos that, that are talking about treatments and cures and preventive measures. I did a webinar last night and I could tell by the questions that came in that most of the information was being pulled from social media, like drinking colloidal silver to kill the virus. And oh, you're going to kill your liver at the same time, probably. <laughs> yeah. um, and just again, um, posts that dental assistants and hygienists are, are sharing information in chat rooms about they're disinfecting their face masks to reuse them, or they're autoclaving their face masks to reuse them. So if it doesn't come from the CDC or the American Dental Association. They're obviously a very credible resource because they work closely with OSAP and the CDC or a state dental association, the same thing, just not social media. I guess that kind of goes right into the next perfect transition here is we just recently had a great conversation with the Tennessee Dental Association president. And so that'll be released here very soon. And there seems like that there's been like a little bit of a disconnect, right, amongst what is a board responsible for doing, what is the dental association responsible. There's certain things that can be mandated by government. There's certain things that can be suggested by associations. And some people are having a hard time. So what is the role of state boards and dental associations right now? Well, that's a really, really good question. Um, I have not seen a lot of information from very many states where the dental boards have taken any specific action. I think it, in terms of like restricting a practice or, or closing a practice, but I, I think that they're relying on the state dental associations or other areas of state government actually uh, public health department to make those types of, of mandates or regulations. And I think what the ADA did in recommending that practices close for three weeks, I think was a courageous move because we all know the financial implications of that. And I loved how they worded the statement that dentistry needs to do its part to help mitigate the spread of the virus. And it's really doing the right thing and, and following the greater good. And many state associations have done that, but because the ADA and the state associations are not regulatory bodies, then it's, it's really a voluntary thing. A practice could choose or choose not to close or limit their practice. But some states actually have issued mandates. And what I've seen is typically coming through a public health department. I know Washington State has one in place until the middle of May. Um, the state of Virginia has one in place and they clarified in the state of Virginia that if you violate this, it's a $2,500 fine and possibly disciplinary ag action against your license. So I think as things seem to be worsening and the numbers of new cases spreading, we may see more states take that action. But the reality is that that if we had a, a national mandate that came out um, that said that all of the practices should be limited for a period of time, it would make it easier. It's the same thing, I think, that many states are, are experiencing with these stay-at-home orders. Some states have them, some counties within a state have them, and others don't. We don't have any real cohesiveness, and that creates confusion. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's exactly right. And that's, we, you know, we are 
we are in the middle of it, you know, because when we talked with, uh, you know, just a week ago after we we chose to close our practices right as soon as the ADA made the recommendation and um, we were looking for guidance from our state board, from our Department of Health, uh, and none came. Right. And uh, it took our state dental association basically, you know, um, producing a pretty, pretty scathing uh, a letter, email out to uh, kind of calling them out. And even after that, mm-hmm. the Department of Health issued a, a statement essentially saying, use your best judgment, mm. uh, which is crazy. And yeah. then finally, the governor shut us down. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so so it's really, I, I, this is, um, and I know there's a lot of political things. We don't want to get too deep into that, but there's a there's a, a lot of, of, of interests here that I know are uh, conflicting. Uh, from from the outside, but really they should not be. Uh, this no. is not. There's really no lack of clarity here on what needs to be happening. Right. Um, and, well, and I think it's we have we have to we have to call for that because unfortunately there's there's folks that are just going to push the limits. We do, and and my guess is that the ADA will take a, a leadership role in that and really looking at again pandemic preparedness for dental practices, because if you listen to what many of the CDC experts and and Dr. Fauci from the NIH is saying that this can happen again. And I remember a number of years ago being at the OSAP annual symposium and hearing someone from the NIH or CDC telling us that it's only a matter of time before this happens. And so we've got to have a plan Um, not only within our profession, but there has to be a better plan again, not to be political, but there has to be a better plan in the country as well. Yeah, that's right. And I, and I, I think this is going to push people to that point, which is good. So let's, let's kind of go into the, uh, uh, from, from the big picture down to the, the, some of the details here, because I think that, that some of the questions that people are wanting to have answered right now, uh, come down to number one, uh, what do I do? if I have to go in and see an emergency patient. You know, we know that uh, there's lots of different definitions depending on the state of what is an emergency. The ADA has tried to clarify that. Um, But let's just assume for the sake of discussion today that it is a true emergency, you know, whatever that might be in your state or what have you. What type of precautions should we be using in our practice if we choose to go in and see an emergency patient? Well, there's a number of things. what the most important thing is, is making sure that it is short duration, just palliative care. For example, if somebody fractures a tooth, we're just going to temporize it right now. We're not going to do a crown prep or we're not going to prep it for a uh, restoration. We're just going to temporize it, something very short duration. Minimize the aerosol production. If you have to use a handpiece or air water syringe, minimize the droplet aerosol production as much as you can and using obviously high volume evacuation, a dental dam if that's possible. But the really key issue is respiratory protection. We are told that our procedure masks, especially the level three masks, which many dental professionals wear, do not protect against the coronavirus. They also don't protect against tuberculosis. So this is very similar to what we would do if we had to do emergency treatment on a patient that we knew or suspected had tuberculosis. You wear an N95 respirator. The challenge right now is that many of those are not available and a lot of them are being funneled to the frontline medical workers in the hospital. So you try to do the next best thing And the CDC recommends a number of things. One would be wearing a level three mask that you have, maybe putting one inside the other, although that's not the equivalent of an N95 mask, and wearing a chin length face shield because then it protects your mask from the droplets um, that may get on that mask and put someone at risk. And I would have minimal um, staffing in, in the office And the recommendation out there is even to um, not have your patient come and sit in the reception area, that they call you on their cell phone when they get to the office, let you know they're there, and you call them and let them know when you're ready, and they come in and they go directly to a treatment room. Um, Those are probably the best 
precautions. But the, the bigger challenge is really narrowing down what is uh, a true emergency and trying to limit exposure. And one of the reasons why the ADA, and they stated in, in their recommendation that they felt that it was better for us to see emergencies in the dental practice was that they wanted to keep the dental patients out of the hospital emergency rooms so that, because they're already overcrowded and in many cases, the emergency rooms are not equipped to treat dental emergencies. So it's not the best. We really shouldn't be seeing patients at all right now unless we have appropriate respiratory protection, but we do what we can. Sure. So there has to be some people thinking right now that if I saw a patient and it was it was an infected patient and we didn't know it maybe it was in that time period or they were a carrier and then mm-hmm. we spread that right or we we had it right and we didn't even know right. we had it because i mean I, I practiced with some very young individuals and and um you know in their younger 20s and you know when you look at individuals like that sometimes we know that those people can be infected and not even be you know showing symptoms and so let's right. say that they're treating and then it gets out that we saw a patient and it, they trace it back to our, our office. And what what's going to happen, right? Is there going to be some tort reform or is there going to be liability on the dentist? And what happens if, right? I mean, I know we're doing some speculation here, but there's some real concerns. Right. Well, I think there's huge risk. And I think there could be some liability, but it may depend on when that exposure took place. If the exposure took place before the recommendation not to treat patients, then it it probably isn't as serious as if it happened now when the standard of care that the ADA has set for us and the mandate in many states is that we don't see regular patients. And I hear from people all the time saying, well, we're just you know, seeing patients as, you know, like every day, just like normal. When you know that that's not the right thing to do and it's not the standard of care and you do it anyway, that would be a worse disaster, I think, for a practice financially than it would just closing down for two to three weeks to see if we can level out the number of new cases. In many cases, the research that I've shown says that liability insurance wouldn't pay because they expect a dental professional to be practicing at the standard of care. And we know Mm. now that that's not what it is. Um, I can't imagine the negative publicity that it would be like the cruise ships that we knew people were staying away from anybody that had been on a cruise ship. If it was known in a community that there was an outbreak of COVID from a dental practice, Who would want to go there? Who would trust those Mm. professionals in that practice? So it's such a risk right now. Yeah, Yeah. we imagine, you know, seeing uh, it's going to happen. It's just a question of it's probably already happened. It's just not maybe gotten out yet that there have been practices that have, you know, I mean, we hear you you hear the craziest stories, right? We only hear we, we hear like the highly filtered versions of this because usually when we hear about things, it's when it's it's published in the paper or the board. Sure. I mean, you, you see things all the time that probably scare you. But yes. I, I mean, you we see stories of offices where, you know, infection control in general is not being done properly. And you have like a dental hygienist or a dental assistant who reports the dentist <laughs> oftentimes is what happens to the, to the board or to the, you know, to the OSHA. Mm-hmm. And... I, I just imagine that those types of, of stories are going to become, uh, as this develops, more common because if you, it, it's different, I suppose, if you don't understand. You know, there's some things that, that maybe you're a new hire as an assistant and you don't really know mm-hmm. yet maybe what's supposed to be done. But everybody knows here. You know, everybody knows the risk of right. aerosols and the dental office. And it's been very clear from everybody that's out there, or, you know, from regulation standpoint, organizational standpoint. And so if you're still choosing to see patients knowing that, um, gosh, what do you, I just think about my, my team. Like if they thought that that was, 
what I was about, uh, man, they, they should take me down, you know, because this is not right. And it's not just about me anymore. It's not just about my risk anymore. It's about the risk to every single patient that comes into that office uh, during that time that you're making that decision. But yet there's some states that are still very free on that. You know, I wonder too, I like if patients are going to look at things a lot differently after this. I mean, you know, we even going into restaurants, you start to pay attention uh, to the cleanliness of the floor, the cleanliness of the table. Now we think about dental offices, people walking into these dental offices. And I think, you know, Gary DeWood spoke to our show and he remembers just like you do going through the HIV scare mm. and mm-hmm. in the eighties. And he talked a little bit about how there was this initial uptick in awareness of what was going on and what was being done. And then some of that kind of subsided and he felt like that you would have some of that and then it would kind of subside. But, I, but do you think that, that this is going to be, Uh, a situation where patients are going to demand or maybe even make notice of like, man, their office is super clean. Their office is not clean. I think that patients are going to scrutinize so much more. And I have said many times, thank God that, that um, social media wasn't available back in the (laughs) HIV AIDS early days but now it is a reality. And so mm-hmm. I don't think patients will be shy at all about going online and posting things about their perception of their practice. This is going to be something that every practice needs to be fine tuning their protocols, reviewing everything about their infection control program and information that they um, disseminate to patients. Because when we are able to open practices up again. It won't be business as usual. Mm. We will probably have some guidance from CDC about what we need to do to make some changes. We may also have some regulations from OSHA. Um, Mm. My fear is that OSHA may start to do inspection programs again. They have been, Tennessee is one of those states where they've been doing Um, They have a local emphasis program and they've been doing unannounced inspections. So I think that that probably is going to be a reality because everything in the news is talking about how hazardous the spatter and the aerosol is in dentistry. And so I think they're going to shine a light on us again Mm -hmm. and we need to be ready for that. So let's talk about, I know this is again, speculation, but Uh, Having been so experienced with this over the years, what are some of the things that you think might change about our infection control protocols? Uh, If you could, again, put out there your speculation, your thoughts on that. I think everybody is thinking about this right now, even from a standpoint of when we open back up, you know, now the call is for donate all of your PPE, right? Which is, I think, very reasonable. Yeah. But then everybody's asking the next question of, well, what am I going to need to have in my office? Is it going to be the same stuff? Is it going to be totally right. different? You know, what are your thoughts on this as it's still unfolding? Sure. Well, and and again, I, I like that you use the word speculation because we really don't know. And, and that that fear of the unknown, of course, is, is always an uncomfortable um, position to be in. Um, and, and you're right that, so we donate all our PPE and now what do we do if we can't get more? Um, someone told me yesterday that they were able to get, uh, five boxes of face masks every five days or so from a, a dental supplier. And now they've been told they can get five boxes every 15 days. Mm. So we don't know the, the, again, the thing to remember is just because this mandate or, recommendation is that we close for two to three weeks, we may not be ready because we may not have the PPE. So I think the things that are going to change the most or that need to change the most, number one is better screening of our patients before they come for their appointments. Mm -hmm. And we've been pretty casual about this, I think, in the past, trusting that our face masks protected us. So a patient would call or we'd confirm a patient and we would talk to them and they would say, oh, yeah, I have a cough or I'm just getting over the flu or I've got a little fever. And we would say, oh, come on in because we didn't want to hold in the schedule 
come on in. We have face masks. It'll be fine. Well, maybe not so much. Um, so I think we need to be screening. And I'm glad to see a number of um, companies out there starting to promote teledentistry so that that might be a way to screen patients a little better than even just a phone call before they come in. Um, I've seen some information coming from CDC and some other groups about asking our patients to wash their hands as soon as they come into the office. So either hand sanitizer, if you can get it, or go into the restroom, please wash your hands. Um, to even asking patients again to wait in the car that we don't have anybody congregate, at least in the near term, mm -hmm. in the reception area before they come back to the chair. But it's going to focus primarily for the team on respiratory protection. And we will find out, I would guess, in the near future, whether we will be required to wear N95 face masks all the time. We don't know that yet, but that's kind of being kicked around. Um, or that we wear uh, perhaps a, a procedure mask, a surgical mask that's a level three with a chin length face shield. Um, we, we simply don't know. The good news we have is that our surface disinfectants that we use in the practice are effective against the coronavirus. Not all of the products have a label claim as yet because they're in the process of getting those approved from the Food and Drug Administration. But if a practice is using a tuberculocidal surface disinfectant that will kill the most difficult microbes to kill, most likely we can trust that it's going to kill uh, coronavirus. And some products will say that it's active against human coronavirus or enveloped coronavirus, but a lot of folks are asking, well, is it going to say SARS, CoV-2 or, or COVID on it? Not yet. It's too soon because this is new. So it, we also may see some changes to scheduling. You know, we may not be able to just jam pack our schedule where we see one patient after another after another um, because we still don't know, is aerosol the most efficient way or an easy way for um, the coronavirus to be transmitted right now droplet is the most effective way but we just don't know all the information we need to know about the virus so mm. it, but people who think that they're going to come back and it's just going to be business as usual we go back to the way we were working before we wear a, a procedure mask and i see so many people wearing it underneath their nose they don't even wear it right um for the near term at least in the next several months I think we're going to be doing things differently. Whether mm -hmm. we continue to do it after that, we simply don't know yet. But mm -hmm. I hear Dr. Fauci say that he believes it's going to take 12 to 18 months for this virus to really cycle down. So we don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if you're listening to this right now and you're thinking, man, when was the last time that I really looked at my OSHA system? Right. My mm -hmm. and, you know, it's interesting because, uh, John, I, I purchased at the beginning of 2020 the ADA OSHA compliance book. It's like three hundred and some dollars, almost four hundred dollars. And I believe it's like three inches thick. Right. Yeah. And we yeah. have like this massive like uh, book that we did uh, to showing what we do in our office. And we 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 try to update that yearly. And uh, we just said, you know what, it's time for us to kind of like, you know, next level this at the beginning of 2020. We had some things happen in our community here um, with mm -hmm. uh, some local offices that had some problems. I won't go into detail with that, <laughs> but it was definitely a backlash on the dental community. And um, yeah. we saw an influx of patients uh, from that office and it's sad, but we wanted, we wanted to be out front and in front of this. And, and I feel, I feel like kind of proud that we're actually jumping in, but there's a lot of stuff and a lot of resources out there. So while we're closed, what is it that we could do in our offices right now? If you're listening to this and you're thinking, man, I need to kind of just, I've got the time. So what do I need to do right now that's founded in science that that when they do add to this, it's be easy just to tack on and amend what we're already doing? 
Sure. Well, there's a number of things. Number one is update your required annual OSHA training. So that includes infection control because we have to do bloodborne pathogens training every year. So update the training, get your manuals out, dust them off and <laughs> go back through and review your, your protocols because OSHA requires and the CDC recommends that you have an infection control or an infection prevention program for your practice that details all the things that you do. How do you clean and sterilize instruments? What's the procedure for disinfecting a treatment room? How do people use their PPE properly? So this is a great time to review that, make sure that that's current and updated. And then if you do have to amend it with some new guidelines or or mandates from OSHA, you can simply add it right into that. But I think what happens a lot of times with practices is they purchase the manual and maybe there's a little bit of an assumption on, on the part of some people, well, I have the manual, so I'm in compliance. But they <laughs> don't understand that they have to make it right. um, customized to their office. I've gone into practices where they tell me, yeah, I have an existing manual. We just need you to update it. And they bring it out and it's still in the shipping box right. or yeah. it's still in the shrink wrap. So, um, and there's lots of, of um, information in there sometimes that teams don't understand. Mm -hmm. And so that's where working with someone, uh, a consultant, um, and there's many of us out there that can help with that, that can really help teams to understand what they're doing and set up the compliance system so that it's easy to understand and easy to use. But this is also the time you're required to do HIPAA training once a year as well. So this is the time to do that as well when you're when you have some downtime. Sure. The yeah. CDC has an infection control checklist that's available on their website. That's a great way to do a checkup on how you're doing things in your practice. Well, and I think that that uh, number one is, is easy right now, like you say, because of the downtime. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got plenty of time to work on these types of things and uh, your team can be, you know, brainstorming on this. They can be reviewing this information. They can be looking at webinars. They can be, you know, really reviewing to make sure you are in compliance with what we already should be doing. And, yeah. uh, and I think, you know, like you said earlier, speculation is, is difficult to know what comes next, but at least we can make sure that we know we're in compliance with all the current recommendations and that we are ready to kind of move into whatever the next part of this becomes as, as things go on. And I think also, your point is well taken that if anything, we're going to be scrutinized much more carefully, uh, definitely not less carefully. And so it pays to be ready for that. And I think that uh, having somebody on your team, if you're not already doing this, you know, some, some practices have someone uh, in on their team that is responsible. And I think everybody should have that. Uh, but if you don't have that person, um, it's time to probably get someone trained, whether it's you as the dentist or whether it's, you know, finding somebody that's interested in this topic or just nominating somebody and then maybe getting them in touch with somebody like Mary or a consultant who actually has real world experience and understands the regulations um, because you got to have all of this information. I mean, we always needed it, but I know that there's some people that just haven't had just haven't done it and just haven't done what they need to do. And now this is a perfect time to kind of do a reboot. It is. It's a perfect time. And I like the I like that term reboot. Um, many people maybe don't understand that OSHA requires that a practice have someone who's a safety coordinator who is mm -hmm. in charge of compliance with um, OSHA standards. So um, bloodborne pathogens, infection prevention, and also hazard communication, chemical safety. The CDC recommends that you have somebody appointed as the infection control coordinator. And these are the kinds of things that, that I would leverage with patients. I have been telling everyone I know and in my Facebook posts, stay engaged with your patients while you're closed. Let them know while we are refining our infection control um, training and protocols so that we make it even safer for you when, when you come back to our office. And this would be a great time to announce, perhaps on social media or on a website, 
that you've appointed someone as the special infection control coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, OSAP, the organization I mentioned before, and the Dental Assisting National Board that certifies dental assistants na nationally has created a great online course that dental assistants or anyone in a practice could um, take advantage of. And they've also created a credentialing process. So mm -hmm. it's possible for a team member in, in a practice to become a certified infection control coordinator. And I think that's something that would be of great comfort to patients. Mm -hmm. Well, this yeah. is really great. And you, as you're talking about resources, you yourself um, are a excellent resource and you have a whole team of people behind you. I want you to talk a little bit about what you're doing right now and while you're talking, I'm going to bring up the website because you've got some great resources right here and take, talk about how people could reach out to you. Oh, sure. Well, they can easily reach out um, to me through my email, which is mary at marygavoni, G-O-V-O-N-I.com. And or my website, which is marygavoni.com. And what I've done is created a number of things. I have and, and something that made me think um, earlier when when you were mentioning um, training for employees, OSHA requires that new employees coming on board have training before they actually start providing um, at risk procedures. And so that's a little tough to do. You know, we hire somebody at the end of the week and they start on the following Monday to work. We don't necessarily have a lot of time to train them if they don't have prior training or prior dental experience, but they need to know risk of infection, how infectious diseases are transmitted and so forth. So we've created video training for new employees so that a practice could easily utilize that to get their employees on board. It, it could also be a good refresher for folks mm. that, you know, it's been a while since we've done it, let's go back and look. But it's very basic type of, of infection control and, and chemical safety training as well. And then my team and I, over the last few weeks, have put together, um, I think now we're well over 100 resources from everywhere we can find them, articles and and CDC guidelines and World Health Association guidelines and put them all together in an ebook format so that everyone could take advantage of this and have all the information together. Certainly you can go and find these resources on your own, but it's very time consuming. So we're trying to make that nice and convenient, not trying to profit off of the well i was just looking at it right here and and if you're watching this stream there is mm -hmm. amazing links to download every pdf you can possibly imagine osha compliance <laughs> yeah. standards i mean it yeah. is next level what you've got on here yeah and you've got a clearinghouse here where people can go to right. to see everything that's kind of currently understood and right. and you know that's one way to do it is you can say well i'm going to go find out everything and i'm going to you know put together a program in my office with my team or somebody on my team is going to be responsible for that or you know they can reach out to you and your team sure. and uh, to somebody who's already made a system out of this and basically say hey we just want the system and you, i know you guys can help with probably any aspect of that whether it's you know checking in somebody's system to see how it is to sure probably, you know, give, starting them from scratch and developing a whole system with them. Right. That's yeah. what we do. And, and again, many practices, those that we've been working with long term or new practices who have um, have found us during this downtime, we're doing lots of remote training. Um, I have started working with a new practice over the last few months and we did our initial um, training yesterday with the team. And the team was really happy because they're at home. Um, but again, they can view the training on their screen. It's a live webinar, so they can ask their questions. And it's very specific to their practice. Mm -hmm. So with the specialty practice, there's some things that they do or don't do. So yeah, we're doing a lot of that. I could probably, if I could stand it, I could probably do it 24 seven right now. Yeah. Well, and I think that's going to be, you know, a huge demand. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to have you on, not only to hear your perspective, mm -hmm. but also I think everybody right now is, is 
asking this question, well, who do I go to? What, what are some of the resources? How can someone, because most people I believe are, are less inclined to know how to do this themselves. You know, there's lots of yeah. things that, that dentists or team members can kind of figure out. Uh, but this is one of those things when you start getting into regulations and you start getting into legal right. issues and OSHA issues and, you know, you, you want to make sure you're doing it right. And I think everybody knows that they just don't always know where to go. Sure. So, and they ahead. don't always have the time to stay up on. Mm -hmm. it. I mean, this is what I do 24 seven is I, you know, stay current on regulations and research. And when you're seeing patients, you don't necessarily have time to do that in a, in a medical practice that's typically owned by a hospital, somebody does it for them. And that's the challenge that we have in dentistry is that we don't have a dedicated HR person or a dedicated safety person. It's, you know, the, the chairside assistant in their spare time, or it's the hygienist in their spare time or the doctor in their spare time or, you know, practice administrator. So it's tough to do without partnering with someone to help bring that information to you. Well, if you're listening to this and you know you you want some resources, I think the first thing to do is to go to the website, amerigavoni.com, and uh, start seeing what all is out there. Um, and that's going to give you a great jumping off point, both into uh, what's happening right now with COVID-19, as well as you know what is going on currently in our understanding of just where we need to be in our practices. And then reach out to Mary if you have specific questions about your practice or your situation. Um, and, and we appreciate Mary, the fact that you are encouraging people, of course, to do it right and do that, doing the right thing during this time, focus on the team and the patients and just keeping people healthy. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, if you like the information that we're putting out there today, definitely want you to, to let us know what you thought. If you have questions, if there's concerns or interest in more of this type of content, uh, we would uh, love to hear from you. And so post uh, on uh, after this uh, Facebook posting, you know, tell us what your thoughts are, get in touch with us on all social media outlets. And also, I know, Mary, you also have got some social media presence as as well. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, also hit Mary up and let her know that you appreciate what she's doing uh, coming on the show and providing this information uh, for for us. So, Mary, thanks a lot for being with oh, us today. Yeah, it's been a great informative show. And remember, two, one more thing we will say uh, to listeners, if you like what we're doing, uh, hit us on Apple Podcasts. Give us a five-star review. That's one of the ways we can get our information out when people are searching for dental podcasts that have good information. So definitely go and give us a review if you like the information we're providing. Um, we will continue to be bringing you more updates from uh, the people who are on the front lines of this, uh, this situation, both from a financial and a clinical and an infection control standpoint standpoint over the coming days and weeks. Uh, be well, be healthy, be careful out there and uh, look forward to speaking with you again soon. So for Wes and for Mary, I'm John and we are the Dental Guys.